There are so many challenges in our world right now. And, you know, this working in this world of sustainability, health, wellness, green, whatever you want to call it, has really started bringing a lot of wicked problems into view. Tony, what's a wicked problem? Well, wicked is the term used to describe some of the most challenging social issues of our time. Wicked problems require a reframing of success. While never fully solved, success in wicked problems means making a difference towards or having an impact on improved outcomes or reduced risk. Wow. So many of the challenges we are facing today are indeed wicked problems. That's an absolute right there. So today, let's talk about a wicked problem we're all dealing with, changing weather. Living green or sustainably is about more than saving on your electric bill and doing your part to protect natural resources. It is about a safer and healthier life for you and your family without sacrificing style, quality, or budget. This is a movement to provide all of us with clean air to breathe and water to drink, safe, healthy food to eat, and places to live, and energy to run the places where we live, learn, work, and play. Join your hosts, Marla Esser Close, the Green Home Coach, and Tony Pratt of The Sound Room to learn how everyday green homes work for you, your family, and your community. Hi, y'all. This is Marla, the Green Home Coach. So excited to be in studio today. We never get to do this anymore. And with Tony, my, what are you, green guy, co-host. You always like have a different nickname for me. How about the guy in the right (laughs) seat? I like that. (laughs) So when we were um, prepping for all of our topics today, one of the things that came up was that I did not drive to St. Louis in driving rain which was really nice because the last few weeks, um, for those of y'all listening, just to bookmark the time, it's June of 2022, and we've had this crazy, crazy weather that's gone back and forth between, like, October and July, and it's only June and May. (laughs) Well, and, you know, it's funny because you said you didn't drive in the rain, which is really surprising because of just how the rain has been coming here, especially in the middle of the country. It's really causing a lot of problems. And I was talking to a friend of mine who works for a land developer last week. And what he was saying is it's really throwing everything into chaos because we're getting these just driving downpours that seem to last for a day or two at a time. And they're just totally soaking the ground to where they can't get heavy equipment (laughs) onto them. So after about, you know, four or five days, it's starting to dry out. You know, nice sunny days, nice, you know, warm heat to to dry out the ground. And they're just about ready to be able to get equipment on. And guess what happens? It rains. It rains again for another two to three days. It's ridiculous. It is driving, pouring rains where you can't even see. So, you know, weather's a funny thing anyway. And living in the Midwest, we've always said, if you don't like the weather, hang on a moment. And Oklahoma, where I live now, is even more so that way. Just being out there on the plains, I guess. There does seem to be a changing pattern of weather that is occurring. You know, I brought this up with some friends last year because we can see it. The last decade or so, the sheer amount of rain we're getting here between March and in reality, November, December sometimes, it's definitely increasing. You can see it. Well, You drove in from, now I know a lot of our listeners don't know the geography of the local area, but you drove in from West County. Did you go down Highway 40? I did, now known as Interstate 64. Did you happen to notice all the concrete sound barriers and the massive overgrowth on them? That wasn't there last year. Right. But lots of rain has helped. Lots of rain is doing this. In April, I basically cleaned out my backyard. I chopped everything I could just to get rid of it. Yeah, I happened to go back there uh, yesterday. (laughs) It's all back. (laughs) It's back with a vengeance. Oh, we've been trying to have work done in our yard since March, and and we're still not done because every time we get started, just like you were saying with the, the land work, by the time it dries out, it rains again. 
the uh, retired CFO of our company, he is from Southern Illinois in a farming community, and he still has family in that community, and he still talks to his old friends from that community. And last year they told him record crops because of all the free rain. Yep. So the reason we wanted to talk about this is because it's not just changing here, it's changing everywhere. And it does seem our weather patterns are actually changing. And and some of that's just cycles. I mean, we know that. There's a lot of potential reasons lots of things are happening. But I think a big part of the changing weather that has really been, you know, on the tips of many people's tongues over the past few years has been the increasing drought in the western part of the United States. And the weather patterns and people movement and jobs and all of this is all tied together, even if we don't think it is or we don't see it. And I know in particular the droughts and the wildfires that have been out there, this has been devastating for so many communities. Uh, That's true. And, you know, that's a great point because if you ask me, I do think this is part of the major problem. Let's start at the beginning, though. Go to the beginning. Let's understand what rain is. Rain is water moisture in the air that reacts with water in the ground. Kind of like a magnet. The two of them react together and it causes rain. Meteorology 101, right? Meteorology 001. (laughs) This is the very basic. I'm just going to dumb this down to the (laughs) lowest common denominator. You need two things for rain. You need water in the air and water in the ground. What are we seeing right now? We're seeing a lack of water in the ground out west. So it can't attract water from the air. Exactly. So it's not triggering that rain until it, the water and the moisture in the air gets further, further, further east in the country, hits the Midwest. It's been holding all of this moisture for so long. Finally, it has water in the ground. The reaction happens and it's like a house party. Everybody wants to show up and it just drops. So that's what we're dealing with. In reality, what we are seeing happen is the moisture that should be going into rain in the West, California, Arizona, you know, Nevada, those states, is coming here. Yeah. And, you know, the parts of the country in particular that are getting a lot of rain, and we see this around the globe, not just here. We just, since we live on this big land mass called North America, we kind of see the patterns coming west to east. The extremes have really gotten much more extreme. And kind of life feels like that in general now that I say that out loud. I'm going to disagree on that one because it really seems like where we are, it's kind of moderated. Oh, see, in Oklahoma, I don't, well, actually, that's kind of true now that you say that because, like, we haven't had the tornadoes knock on wood. But you can't compare Oklahoma to St. Louis. No, you cannot. St. Louis... And a lot of people don't realize this. St. Louis is in a meteorological sweet spot. It's a meteorological anomaly. I know, try saying that three times fast. I want to hear you. No, 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 no. So is that because of the river convergence here? Uh, No, it's basically, and this is something I learned in college. Marla knows this, but most people do not. Two of my roommates in college were both meteorology majors, and all three of us for a little time worked at Fox 2's affiliate here in St. Louis in their meteorology department, one of which actually went on to become a weather forecaster for Fox 2. Anyway, where I'm going with this... You were talking about the topography in St. Louis from a weather perspective. So in St. Louis, if you move the city 100 miles north or 100 miles south, it's more like every other city in the country. Okay. Most cities, except for St. Louis, have two main weather patterns. You have the jet stream that moves west to east. Mm -hmm. Then depending on where you're at, you are either affected by the Arctic or the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. So So if you're more of a southern city, you get the weather effect from the Gulf of Mexico coming up. Okay. If you're a northern city, you get the blast from the Arctic coming down. Most of the time, yeah. St. Louis is the one city in the country that gets both of those. So we have three weather patterns. Now, weather forecasting is basically two mathematical equations combined, except in St. Louis, it's a third, which throws everything off. Well, and that's funny. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I remember so many times thinking there was one of three ways storms would come in 
in Oklahoma. I mean, in St. Louis. I can't remember where I am today, folks. And in Oklahoma, it is generally two. In reality, it's either down the river, up the river, or across the river. There is a pattern that comes straight up I-44, though. Mm -hmm. Well, true. That's a strong pattern because that's... We're just talking general. Okay. And that's those storms that come out of the southwest and come up. Now, you brought up the rivers. So because we're at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi, this is the second largest water flow, freshwater flow in North America. The largest is just a little further down south when the Ohio comes into that. So we're a state surrounded by water. Much like the Great Lakes and the lake effect, we do see a river effect and it amplifies a lot of these weather patterns. So pardon us for jumping down this rabbit hole. (laughs) But why this all matters is because it's part of helping us to gauge the change Mm -hmm. that we're seeing in the weather. And, you know, some of that is, you know, like in Oklahoma, we've actually seen fewer tornadoes. That's a good thing. But those tornadoes are showing up in other parts of the country where they rarely show up and where people are not prepared for them. So, you know, some of those have been devastating, whereas in a place that's more used to tornadoes, they may not have been as bad. But it's like, I remember a few years ago when the earthquakes in Oklahoma were really ramping up, a friend of mine that I grew up with who now lives in California said, oh my gosh, hell must be freezing over. There was earthquakes in Oklahoma and thunderstorms in LA. (laughs) And California doesn't have thunderstorms like we do in the Midwest. And I thought that was, I mean, that was several years ago when that comment happened. And it does feel that way that, you know, Things that don't normally happen in one part of the country are showing up a lot more. And we had the massive freeze last year in Tulsa or Tulsa in Texas and Oklahoma. And there's been some very, very strong weather patterns that have you know, been a big part of the news. And I don't know if it helps, but naming all of our storms has been an interesting occurrence now. So I don't know that that's neither here nor there. Well, are we seeing potentially maybe a climate shift? Perhaps, yeah. There's a lot of conversation around why our weather is changing and the also the acceptance that it is and that since it is changing and we can you know science can show that we can measure data we can measure data you know we need to do something about it we can't just stick our head in the sand or the mud depending on where you are and say okay you know, I'm not gonna, it's just, just going to change and so that's part of what I really want to talk about as we wrap up this conversation today, is what can we do about this? And there's short-term solutions, and there may be some longer-term solutions as well. So weather changing, the rain cycle is definitely a big part of that. What is causing that to change? A lot of different theories, a lot of different... We both have some. Pieces. Yeah, and you know, a big part of the conversation right now has been water use, which, oh my gosh, gets into like a whole another series of conversations. But summarize that for us, if you can, <laughs> well, <laughs> quickly. Let's think about water usage, especially out west. We have a lot of large, major cities that in reality are in a desert. Yes, thanks to air conditioning, they can now be there. Exactly. Well, while air conditioning makes the climate more palatable, what about the water? We got to get water somewhere. And a lot of times it's, you know, here in St. Louis, it's very easy. Where are we getting water from? The river. Well, and we forget that there is only a very limited amount of fresh water on the face of this planet. And it's just recycled. It just goes through the the water cycle. And any given day, a billion people on the planet have problems accessing clean, fresh water. We know that. However, we keep putting bigger and bigger cities and more people keep moving to these locations And there are areas where there is no water. So there's not enough natural resources to really be supporting these cities, yet we're building them anyway. And they keep getting bigger and bigger, more people, more companies, all of that keep moving to them. And we have to get water from somewhere else to there. So case in point, Las Vegas, Colorado River has to feed that. I don't even know where Phoenix is getting their water. I'm assuming it's off the same thing. Like meat, I thought. Okay. Or is that Las Vegas? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's a lake down there that's a reservoir that I thought was Phoenix's water. But still, it's having to be pumped in. 
it is being subsidized. So people aren't really seeing the true cost of that. If the true costs were factored in, maybe fewer people are moving to these locations, maybe fewer businesses move to these locations, and maybe we have less strain on the natural water resources of those locations, which help to stabilize the weather patterns. Want to find and sell the value of green homes and features in your clients' projects and homes? I'm Marla Close, the Green Home Coach, and I have built What Makes a Green Home Green audio program just for you. This program offers an easy-to-understand language audio trainings that are easy to consume on the go with resource guides to help you absorb the information and reference it easily in your day-to-day -day activity. Your investment in this green home knowledge could unlock thousands of dollars more in business for your home projects. Check out what makes a green home green and how it will help you find and sell the value of green homes and features in your clients' projects and homes. Greenhomecoach.com backslash home pro. So what was interesting also is how much water is being purchased and for what uses. And especially out in the West in California, where we found this article from Forbes, talking about the water prices soaring in California's Central Valley, where a huge amount of our food is grown and shipped all over the country. And as the drought, actually this article framed it as a mega drought, as it's worsening, there is, you know, buying up of water rights. <laughs> and that's challenging. How does a small farmer compete against a huge conglomerate that owns Huge amount of water rights. Well, this is a separate podcast. Oh my gosh, this is a whole series. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this has been going on with the small farmer versus the, the conglomeration of, of farmers for how many decades? They don't. They don't compete. Basically, the large corporations that own them, you know, all, all the big farms, they have the ability to use their resources and create hedging strategies and buy options on commodities. And in this case, that commodity just happens to be water. We are well aware that there's been a huge amount of conversations around if water is an inalienable right, inalienable right, if it is something that it can be commoditized and purchased in. You know, there's been a lot of conversations around this that there are not answers. This is definitely a wicked problem. States still fight over water rights. Look at all the uh, water right fights over the Missouri River. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why it's not a transportation river through Missouri, at least. I don't know about out west, but it's not anymore on yeah. in Missouri. You go on the Mississippi, you go at the confluence, you look at the two. They are night and day different. One is more activities, fishing, boating. The other one, barge traffic. Transportation. Yep. Mississippi is huge transportation conduit in this country. So... Water has many aspects, changing weather being just one of those. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, kind of a chicken and the egg, right? Because changing weather affects water patterns. Water patterns affect the weather. You don't know where to start. It's a, it's a perpetual cycle. It is a perpetual cycle. And just like any other cycle, you have to just kind of jump in and start somewhere. You can't always, I think a lot of the times we feel like we're debating where we should start rather than starting. Well, and remember, too, there are natural patterns that exist. Absolutely. And those patterns are going to continue no matter what. But now you get potentially mismanagement. You've got people actions coming uh -huh. into play. And what happens there? It throws things out of whack. Well, that pattern continues to go. It's just now amplified. So this is exactly why this is a wicked problem, because it's taking a lot of different solutions to come at this. And, you know, some change is just inevitable. Some change we have likely impacted more or sped things up or slowed them down and perhaps changed the natural cycle of things. But what it really results in is that we need to figure out how to do this if we as a society, as a place, as a gathering of people and ideas and where we live, if we want to continue in that, we got to find some way to deal with the results of what is happening with this changing weather, driven by differing uses of water and many other elements. So 
you know, we've got, I wish I could remember the name of this gentleman that I read about who was talking about, I think he was a Harvard professor, saying change is here, period. You know, whether it's climate change, weather change, whatever you want to call anything, change is here. And no matter what, we're going to have some mitigation, some adaptation, and some suffering. And the question is what amount of each? Well, okay, let's just take that comment. Mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in that order. Let's just talk about those three things and apply it to our issue here with water and a lack of water out west. Okay, so we have moved all these people into these large you know, metropolitan areas in a desert. In multiple times. Multiple places. So the mitigation is you get water to them somehow, whether we're taking it from point A and pushing it to point B and stripping basically the water table somewhere else to feed these people. So that's our mitigation. Adaptation, you learn how to survive in the warmer climates. We've done that through air conditioning and innovation and all that. Well, that's great. Before we get to the suffering, what do we always joke about is the first rule of environmental management, understanding the law of (laughs) unintended consequences. So while we have mitigated and adapted the problem, that's not what is going to solve this. Let's get to the suffering. Instead of subsidizing water for these cities, maybe it's time to start charging the true cost. We have that challenge, not just with water, with many other things. Well, with many other things. Yes, we do. Yes. And... That in and of itself is another deep dive into another set of wicked problems. So if you look at, let's just look at this from a weather perspective. And, and we've been very specific today. I don't think we meant to be, but the water aspect of weather. We realize there's the storms and all this other aspects of changing weather that we're not getting to. And nor can we in a 30-minute-ish podcast. <laughs> so we know that, folks. But just from the water perspective and the changing weather due to that water, I think we have to think about things a little differently. And we're starting to see people recognize and build with smarter water, what uses of water and ways to conserve it. And so they can make that, you know, limited amount of water goes further, stretch further. But it's not just how to use it more wisely. We also do have to figure out how to get water. And there may be policy changes. There may be I don't know. There's got to be a rethinking and a reframing in some respects because we're talking, you know, billions, not billions, billions of dollars, millions of people, Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of acres of farmland that are affected in the middle of all this. It's not just how people are living or how people are working. It's like how we're feeding people and how we're supporting jobs and so many other things that come into what appears to be very innocuously, a very small topic or a very small piece of the topic, yet it has these huge outreach effects. Well, you know, I think the agricultural community, for the most part, has probably adapted to this better than most. Mm. You know, you look at it, they're going away from just the big, um, you know, irrigation systems that were throwing water everywhere to more of a drip. True, but they got to have water to put in the drip. But But they're taking less water and figuring out how to stretch it. A lot of them use drones now to, to measure where the water is going, you know, and computers to plan it all. It's amazing, actually. It is amazing. We have some great technology tools that we can bring. But right now, as long as those farmers are located in the Midwest, they're not even thinking about this because of the amount of downfall that is hitting them every freaking week, it seems. So part of this is how do you capture that water? How do you recharge the aquifers? How do you, I mean, there's all these different things that come. I know watching the heavy rains the last couple of weeks, you know, in Oklahoma City, so much of the water is just raced through the stormwater systems, goes out to the rivers, and eventually goes out to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's essentially, you know, wasted because it's now becoming salt water, ocean water, as opposed to just remaining fresh water where it can be reintroduced into the cycle. So even strategies to keep water in place instead of sending it down eventually to the Gulf of Mexico can help. Well, and, you know, look at St. Louis, St. Louis County. If you build a new house in St. Louis County, especially an offsite house, you got to have a rain guard. You do? That's code. I did not know that. Yeah. When you were still here, remember they fought it for so long. Well, we went out and looked at a number of rain gardens back 
few years ago, and I remember at the time they were doing that watershed study. Mm -hmm. So right now you have to have it. Anytime the municipality does any kind of like major infrastructure improvement, roads, things like that, they have to put in rain gardens. So talk about unintended consequences. So I've been, you know, in the middle of repairs and remodels in our home in Oklahoma City. And one of the potential causes for some of the need for the repair, some of the damage that was caused, and we we can't prove this, but some of it is likely water Mm -hmm. from our downspouts helping to shift to the soil underneath. And we build slab on grades there, not near as deep foundations as we build in St. Louis. So we're trying to fix as many little things that could potentially be the culprit without really knowing what the culprit is. But it was very interesting to note how differently Oklahoma treats water runoff than here because it is a more, a little bit more arid, although it's gotten a lot of rain the past year or two. They don't put gutters up on houses automatically in Oklahoma City because we just normally don't have enough rain to make it worthwhile. And now, as it, the climate is becoming a little wetter there, you, know, you see, start to see more people doing, in addition to gutters, maybe doing rain barrels or something else to capture the water. So it's like, how do you use different strategies to overcome this feast or famine effect? And everybody has, can do something for themselves, be it a rain garden, be it a rain barrel, be it a desert garden instead of a yard needing water. All of these little steps add up. And then we still got the big steps that, you know, we got to figure out. How do we get water to entire cities? How do you use what water you have as wisely as possible and what policies will come into play? Well, that's why this is a wicked problem is because yeah. this is not a simple question. <laughs> it is not. That has a, a simple answer. There are so many variables involved. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of screaming from different stakeholders because people are going to have to admit that their policies were wrong and they're going to have to search for ways to fix them. And people do not like that. They don't. And the finger pointing doesn't help. Right. And I wish to goodness we would get beyond this finger pointing because it does not help to solve anything. And I'm sure somebody's ego gets feeling better when they don't feel like they caused the problem. And in in many ways, it doesn't matter what caused or who caused the problem. It's that it happened and that we need to fix it collectively. Absolutely. But you and I understand, because we're both realists, that there's always going to be somebody trying to say, no, I don't want to do that because I don't believe in that. Or because it affects my personal interest or my business interest. Exactly. And, you know, follow the money trail. But nonetheless, it's not going to necessarily fix it until enough of us can lay it down on the table. And as we always say... Tony, we want to put the problem in front of us, not between us. Yeah, we have to have an actual, realistic, open discussion about what the problem is. So despite what is changing the weather, what is changing the water patterns, they are changing. Mm -hmm. It is potentially a great sacrifice not only to the people directly experiencing it, but those of us in other parts of the country that depend for instance, on produce coming from Central California. So, you know, there's always a bigger picture than just that little microcosm of what appears. So let's very quickly, as we're wrapping up, let's give just a couple of quick tips that people can enact on their own to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Come up with an idea. We mentioned a couple already. Right, but those are more bigger pictures. So those aren't simple. It's always about land management. Yeah, but what can an individual do? Individual, well, we talked about that, rain gardens. Rain garden or rain barrel or both. Well, with a rain barrel, though, you have to make sure it's legal. Yes, but that's being more and more places. I get it. I get it. it, But you remember we had that uh, issue with Colorado for all those years. So you and why I say this, some municipalities, some states, they won't allow water collection because they feel that it has to work its way back into the river system. So if you, you know, do check it out. Um, We just got our first two. They're not installed yet. And we just missed all these great rains. And we bought them, interestingly enough, more to solve our downspout issues than we did to collect water. 
and then the front yard, that was kind of the opposite. So usually people think rain barrels first to collect water, not so much to solve a water issue. <laughs> However, though, they're a great idea if you do have a garden. Yeah. Because now you're just reusing that water to irrigate the garden. Basically keeping it on site. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts. You know, be mindful of, if you can, buy local produce. Then encourage things to happen locally, I think, helps in any time because we've gotten so dependent on shipping things and things from other parts of the country that we can put greater pressure on those systems. So anytime we have an opportunity to do something local can help release a little bit of that pressure. So that might be another idea that doesn't necessarily sound as related to rain and to water. Well, and if we're going to go on that train of thought, if you're doing any kind of landscaping, native plants. That's a big one. You know. Zero scaping. That way it's used to the environment. You don't need to do any extra watering. They don't need extra care. You just plant them and let them go. So there you go. So some good ideas to get us started. And I think standing up and speaking out when you have a chance helps. I think it's important that the people that make our policies understand that, you know, a lot of us are listening and we care and that things need to change. And let's face it, politicians are scared of just the average person. <laughs> and there you go, folks. That's going to be a great way to end it today. So think about your wicked problems. Think about how to be part of the solution. We'd love your feedback. Please leave a comment on any of your favorite podcast apps. And we look forward to seeing you for our next Wicked Problem here on the Everyday Green Home Podcast. That wraps this episode of the Everyday Green Home Podcast. Get the show notes with all the resources mentioned in this episode. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Want more? Join the Love Your Everyday Green Home private Facebook group for more resources and behind-the-scenes insights. And remember that living a little better and greener is easier than you think.